Okay, I think I got this going on. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Welcome to the Black Muslim is Shining series, Instagram Live of 2020, 2024, my goodness. Just gonna give everybody a few minutes before we start. Welcome everyone. I'm Zahra from the CCMW National Board. Welcome. How's everyone maintaining? We say maintaining these days just because I feel like we're all living in such a state of holding multiple feelings at the same time that we're just maintaining. Um, so hope everyone's been maintaining well. Looking forward to the conversations we're going to get into tonight. Thank you to everyone who's been following the page and following the spotlights we've been posting about um, brilliant Black Muslims in the community doing amazing work. It's a series CCMW has been doing, I believe, for about three or four years now, um, where we spotlight various Black Canadian Muslims and the work they do in their communities and their various disciplines just to give some shine over the month of um, February for Black History Month and also leading into March, which is Women's History Month and International Women's Day. So it's a series that has been really popular and really successful and that we've been trying to keep going. And part of that has also been doing these Instagram Lives where we interview various Black Muslims and spotlight the work they do. So we have some exciting folks to share with you tonight. Unfortunately, one of the speakers that we did have advertised on our flyer, Warda Yusuf, unfortunately cannot make it right now um, for tonight. She's going through some things right now. So we're sending her love and care and inshallah, whatever she's going through, she can get through it and we will be able to connect at another time. But we do still have um, Doha El Mardi who will be joining us in a few minutes and uh, Warda, Warda Yusuf, who will be joining us as well. So excited to get into some conversations with them. But just to give y'all an update in terms of what uh, CCMW has been doing and the Black Mus the growth and success of the Black Muslim Shining series, I just wanted to highlight for you guys, in case you didn't know, that in 2023, we actually introduced an expansion of the Lila Falman Scholarship to include a Black Muslim Shining Scholarship which was um, a scholarship that's specifically for a Black Muslim a woman pursuing studies in Canada. And it's just a scholarship that was created intentionally to acknowledge and, and the, um, the importance and of supporting Black scholarship. Um, and that we were very intentional about that and just recognizing the need for that and how that aligns with our values of, of creating an equitable and inclusive society and that centering black scholarship is an important part of doing that. So we really hope that people will um, go to the website and donate um, to the to the scholarship. We've committed to at least one every year, um, inclusive of the other Lila Fallman scholarships that we distribute, but at least one every year will be um, dedicated to a black Muslim woman um, pursuing scholarship. Thank you, Arshia. Um, so I'm going to look and see. It's been a while since I've done a live, so please be patient with me um, while I figure out how to add guests. I do believe I saw our first guest, Doha, um, enter the chat. I just have to figure out how I get to her now to um, invite her in. Um, oh, I also did want to highlight some of the other things we're doing as part of the Black Muslim Shining series. We have an event on the 17th. It's a Saturday, I believe it's at 3 p.m. Please go on the website for details of the location. It's an in-person gathering where we'll be able to network. Um, we have the brilliant Tai Saleh of um, the Red Ma'at um, Collective. If you've been following her page on Instagram, if you haven't, please go check her out. But she's been a brilliant speaker and she covers a lot of issues of the diaspora, specifically um, what's happening in Sudan as well. Um, and she's just a brilliant, brilliant woman and sister that we're looking forward to engaging um, at that event so please come out for that if you can um, again on February 17th and let me just check my notes to make sure I didn't miss anything else I think we're good so I'm gonna look for Doha oh thank you Doha for sending me a request that makes my life a lot easier um, so let me get her to join inshallah and we could get this I think I did that right let's see oh wait go live uh, yes I think so Assalamu alaikum Doha. Wa alaikum as -salam. Can you hear me well? I could hear you, but I can't see you. Is that a me problem? 
I can see you very well. Me? me? Yes. Okay. Well, if Wait. you can see me, that's fine. Can everybody else see both me and Doha? Can someone just like put in the chat that they're seeing both? Because I'm literally just looking at myself, which is fine. Okay. Awesome. Thank you for confirming that. So let me introduce Doha. It's unfortunate that I can't see you. I feel like there's so much better interaction when I can see. Uh, no, nope, that took me off. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, do you, does, somebody, does somebody know how to do that? Can somebody coach me through? Um, it's all good. I will just... Um, doing a live on Instagram. I've never done this before, so I can't help you at all. <laughs> I've done been alive before and I've been able to see usually the split screen but for some reason when I'm doing it right now it's just um it's just showing myself so it, it feels awkward just talking to myself but I'll make it work because it seems from the comments that people are seeing both of us so alhamdulillah it's all good as long as we get the conversation across it's all good so I'm just going to introduce you Doha if that's okay I'm going to yeah. read out a little bit of a bio so Doha El Mardi is a Sudanese nonprofit professional she's dedicated to anti-oppression social change and creating positive impact through community organization facilit and facilitating collective work she has developed and facilitated various educational workshops and curriculums and trainings on issues such as climate justice gender issues and anti-racism for both schools and nonprofit organizations. She has a Bachelor of Science in Environmental Studies and Disaster Mitigation and is currently pursuing a Master's in Human Systems Intervention. So we welcome Doha. Thank you so much for taking the time to share your work tonight and all the amazing stuff that you've been doing. So I'm going to jump into some questions for you and people listening in, feel free as the conversation is going to pop in some questions as well. I'll try to like keep an eye out for them and make some mental notes to ask them as well so that there's a bit of interactive engagement but I'll start off the conversation and um, Doha you're Sudanese um, so what I would really like to learn a little bit more of because unfortunately there's a lot happening in Sudan right now that we're not hearing a lot about um, so if you could share with us a little bit from your own perspective what has been going on and how it's impacting the Sudanese diaspora both in Canada and worldwide Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Zahra. It's so nice to to be with you. But I would really like I would really like that you are able to also see me because it's kind of awkward. Uh, this yeah, right. <laughs> um, but yeah, thank you so much. I'm I'm very happy to be in conversation with you tonight, and uh, of course, also thank you to CCW for um, providing the space for this conversation. Um, so yeah, as you mentioned, I am from Sudan. I actually came to Canada in 2018, um, and, and um, I've I've uh, so I actually grew up in Brunei. So I did not grow up in Sudan. I grew up in Southeast Asia, but I went to Sudan. Uh, my family all moved back to Sudan uh, when it was time to do my undergrads. So I did my undergrads in Sudan, and um, I stayed in Sudan for some years to work, um, and. Um, and yeah, so today is actually exactly 300 days since the war has started in Sudan. Um, and as you said, um, unfortunately, there isn't a lot of sort of like, at least on the mainstream media level, there isn't really a lot of highlight of what's going on. Um, you know, there was a little bit of it at the at the onset of the war back back in April. There was a lot of coverage uh, in the news, but as soon as you know everybody evacuated, like all the foreigners were evacuated, a lot of the organizations were evacuated, and diplomats and so on. Um, unfortunately, it has really kind of went down the attention on Sudan. But it has been 300 days since the war started. The war started uh, on April 15th last year. Uh, so really kind of like towards the end uh, of Ramadan uh, mm -hmm. when it started and sort of close to Eid. Um, so, yeah, and, you know, maybe, of course, it's like a very long conversation and I think deserves its own sort of like its own time to really sort of unpack what's going on in Sudan and like what's happening and, and why did we get to this situation right now. Mm -hmm. But I do want to give some like very broad highlights. As I said, the war started on April 15th last year, um, but this has been a series of um, a series of 
uh, of a lot of events that have been happening. And I would really like, I think we could really trace all of this even way back to um, colonization, right? Because a lot of the roots of what's happening right now, unfortunately, has um, has its roots back uh, back on British colonization and different forms of supremacy that have that have happened in Sudan. So we can really, you know, we can go back to the 50s, we can go back to the 20s, we could really go back to uh, um, a, a long time ago. But um, but these colonial practices and these colonial policies were unfortunately upheld in Sudan throughout the different regimes that took over, the different military regimes and different governments that have taken over. And, um, uh, and, and Sudan has been for the past, uh, since 1989 actually, ruled by the Bashir regime which is a, um, was a brutal dictatorship that uh, a lot of people in Sudan have been fighting for so many years to get rid of this regime. Um, and so fast forward in 2018, in December 2018, uh, a revolution started in Sudan. This was a revolution that started outside of, outside of the capital city. It started in Damazin and Abbara. So these are you know, cities, out, mm. cities outside. And, um, and it took over the entire country. So everybody was out in the streets uh, protesting. You know, in the, in, at the beginning, it was protesting the economic conditions that people were living under. It was very, very expensive to even afford to buy bread for so many people. So basic sustenance was really difficult. Um, but people really took onto the streets and it was a very, very powerful. And I think, I think really like the Sudanese revolution really needs to be um, understood and studied um, at so much length because it is a very, very powerful revolution. Um, mm. uh, and it was predominantly young people and predominantly women mm. who were the mm. ones who you know, were protesting. Um, and so this revolution has led to uh, al-Bashir's regime. Uh, uh, well, I wouldn't say the regime, but the president himself, uh, he, he lost power in April due to, due to the the, the revolution and you know the strength of what was going on um, and since then there has been a number of political agreements that um, were sort of that were happening in the country throughout that period and a part of those agreements were agreements that were made with the two factions that are now in in the leading the war so that is the Sudanese armed forces so this is mm -hmm. the military basically mm -hmm. Sudan and the and something called the rapid support forces locally known as Jinjawit they are uh, uh, mercenaries you know they are uh they're led by a warlord who was really a part of um the the genocide that happened in darfur in the 2000s so really really a very terrible militia very brutal militia that was unfortunately empowered by the bashir regime to be as powerful and in fact you know on the same level of the military and so on april last year well before that actually on october um they led october 2021 both the military and, and the militia um, did a coup against the civilian power mm. that they were sharing. The power. So co they committed a coup and they took over to rule the country together. And then on April of last year, um, they fought with each other. And mm. this was sort of a out in the capital city in Khartoum, where um, it is the most predominant. It is the, the high has the highest population in Sudan, uh, and so millions of people Are were trapped. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so millions of people were trapped uh, under this sort of urban warfare that is still going on. Um, and unfortunately, since then, the situation has gone so bad. It is really, um, it is really, it, it, I mean, I've seen some of the headlines and some of the, some out outlets and they're calling it the largest humanitarian crisis in the world. And I've also seen the largest humanitarian crisis in modern history. Mm -hmm. So really, mm -hmm. um, really the impact is so huge. And, you know, Sudan's population is something around like a little over 46, between 46 million to 48 million. Mm -hmm. Now 10.7 million of those people are internally displaced. That is a very, very large population. 25 million people are in dire um, needs for humanitarian assistance. Uh, more than half of those people are children. Um, so th that's the situation. A lot of people have, have died, have been killed. A lot of people um, have been injured. Of course, the healthcare system has completely collapsed. And many people, you know, many people have left, you know, including my family mm -hmm. and, and other families have been able to leave Sudan, but a lot more people aren't able to evacuate, aren't able to leave people, you know, not, not everybody has the privilege to be able to mm -hmm. run away from something like this. So 
it's it's really um this is a situation that's been really heavy on all Sudanese people, especially given the gravity of the revolution over the past mm -hmm. year and how much hope uh, we all had uh, to see some to see some you know positive changes. But um, that's the situation, and um, I think we really you know we, we really need a lot more attention to what's happening in Sudan and a lot more more solidarity. And I can share later as well as we speak like some of the uh, concrete ways that at least in Canada. Um, that we can do. Right. Inshallah, yes, we definitely would like to get those resources. And for everyone listening in, please do try to follow some accounts that are covering a lot of this. I wouldn't be surprised, especially like your point on colonialism. I'm sure there's a lot of government intervention that we don't know about that's probably in the wrong ways supporting um, the conflict, right? Um, because we know a lot of these conflicts are connected to colonialism, whether that's historically or in how they recognize that there, it was a revolution that was powerful. And we see this happening actually in the Caribbean all the time when there's revolutions that happen that want to divest from colonialism, want to divest from imperialism, want to divest from the things that keep us separate. There's covert efforts through through um, the community to, um, to, to put a stop to it. Um, so it's a really tangled, complicated situation, but we really need to educate ourselves on those, on these issues, make the connections and show our support, inshallah, in whatever ways we can. So thank you for, for enlightening us just a little bit. I know it's so much to unpack um, in such a short amount of time, but that was that was pretty thorough, actually. <laughs> I actually learned quite a bit in that, in that little five minutes that you gave us. So thank you for that. Um, I wanna learn a little bit more about your experience at as a Sudanese, as a Black and Muslim woman, because you've, you, like you said, you've, you grew up um, in various places all over the globe. So you've been in Sudan, uh, Malaysia, I believe as well, the US, I believe as well, and now you're in Canada. Can you speak to a little bit of like how your experiences differed in, in various regions of the world? I'm just curious how, um, how that, that, how you might have experienced that yeah. as a Black Muslim, Sudanese descent. Yes, thank you so much, Zahra. Um, yeah, so I, I think it's it's interesting because obviously every place has its own sort of social um, system in place, right? But there are, mm -hmm. unfortunately, especially our realities as women, um, there are things that are unfortunately in common that we experience in many places. Um, you know, I think in the different parts of the world that I've lived, unfortunately, safety and security for me as a woman has always been uh, to varying degrees, uh, mm -hmm. something that, um, that of course has been present, right? I think as, as women, a lot of the times we think a lot before we go to places, before we even move to new cities, uh, we think about, you know, how is it like living there as a woman? A, B, how is it like living there as a black woman? Um, mm -hmm. Or being there as a black black woman, you know, and I think, I think like growing up when I was younger, obviously I was with my family and, you know, my parents and, and I grew up, Brunei is a, is a predominantly Muslim country. So I grew up in a very um, sort of uh, conservative Muslim uh, community. Um, and then I, when I moved to Sudan, I, it was, I spent formative years of my life in Sudan. And then when I moved there, it was still, you know, during the time of the Bashir, the Bashir regime. And, and this regime had, um, really really terrible laws in place for women i mean they had terrible laws in general for everybody <laughs> but more specifically um they had terrible laws that really Im impacted women differently um uh you know i can think of the public order laws in sudan that were imposed for many many years and these are laws that regulated how women dress they regulated um how we show up in spaces whether it's private spaces or public spaces mm -hmm. Um, and of course, towards different degrees, women are um, really deeply impacted by these laws, right? And I mean, I, I think still in Sudan, I was still there, you know, with my family. Um, I'm a light-skinned Black woman, so to a certain degree, um, I, I don't experience these laws as, as worse as dark-skinned uh, Black women in Sudan uh, would experience. We also unfortunately have a lot of issues with um, class as many places mm -hmm. in the world, right? Class is a really huge, uh, is a really huge part of, part of uh, the way that these systems work. Um, mm -hmm. and so, and so, yeah, and so really, um, 
experiencing that in Sudan, I think A, like obviously really uh, was really difficult, but I think the core thing for me in Sudan is that I've also been able to be in community with and meet a lot of incredible Sudanese women in Sudan who have been fighting this regime day and night and have really lost so much. Um, whether it's, you know, because there, there's even like different layers in Sudan is like what you're experiencing is you're experiencing misogyny on a familial level. So, on fa you know, on a family level, there's a lot of restrictions that are put in place, whether even you know, for myself, it was even restrictions of like where I would go or, you know, how long I would be outside of the house and just things like that. But then you also have it on a societal level so you really kind of mm -hmm. face it in school and, and at work and in the streets and in public transportations so really a lot of that and and one of the one of the wonderful thing about the revolution in sudan is that there was also that to a large extent th this work done by sudanese feminists on right. making yeah on making sure that the revolution is also a revolution that brings um that brings uh feminist concerns and women concerns to the forefront because again women were leading the revolution as well right mm -hmm. um and then i guess moving to the united states uh was really interesting when i moved to the united states i was a hijabi woman so there was also this element of being mm -hmm. black and muslim and being a hijabi um mm -hmm. at, a, at a time that i think you know i mean at the time that i I went there it was you know obama's last year and it was trump's first year so i was in, in really witnessing that sort of transition mm -hmm. um at least just in terms of the in, the environment around mm -hmm. me mm -hmm. um but of course you know you, we know historically the united states has always been unfortunately a very ra racist place to to be in a very islamophobic place and and um and and you know but it, but it was really uh, that was really heightened the experience of the addition of being a muslim woman and a hijabi muslim woman was really a heightened experience in terms of my security and my safety and where you know how i moved around um and then moving here to canada you know i moved here as a refugee so i was an asylum seeker when i moved here so mm -hmm. there was really again this added layer of um uh the highlight being what it's like to be uh to have the different types of paperwork <laughs> you know and how that really affects that affects a lot of things you know yeah. it's like you would your passport that you carry like the paperwork that you carry really really affects your experience in the world um in these systems that we live in but i think most importantly like i really um in all of these places the thing that i that i really cherish and the thing that i've learned is to be in community with other mm. black women other black other muslim women that's really i think what what carried me uh, in all of these spaces yeah. yeah community is so so important and even you saying that in terms of the supports <clears throat> when you came to canada i mean i'm thinking now of um it's reminding me of um our current government sort of stance in terms of accepting refugees coming from Palestine and Sudan, mm -hmm. and the sort of restrictive approach in terms of the pathways for them getting here. And then even once they're getting here, um, the supports they're not getting, that we know there's precedent for in terms of how they handled um, refugees coming from Ukraine, right? Mm -hmm. um, and how we're seeing such a like stark difference, like, like it, the anti-blackness could not be any more apparent, right? Um, it's actually quite scary. So um, in terms of actions that we could take, I think that's something we should keep an eye on um, and put pressure on our governments right now in terms of making sure um, um, there's no restrictive pathways. Like right now, it's like it's, it's absurd, like the requirements. Um, and then there's lack of access to health care. There's lots of lack of access to settlement support once they're here, which is unacceptable i'm sorry um completely unacceptable and we really need to be pushing putting pressure on our leadership and that's what we can do as a community um i think one thing that has been sort of invigorating um and sort of a, a beacon of hope through all these sort of things that are happening on multiple fronts because of social media we actually do have access to information and to people on the ground where so we're not so colluded by by media narratives because if it was just up to the news alone like we would be we would be hearing none of this right none of these stories none of these issues which is frightening but also affirming because i think 
we're seeing a lot of knowledge mobilization. We know that the majority of the world wants a ceasefire. We know that the majority of the where the stance is, is of the moment, but we're also seeing how power is so concentrated, yeah. right? Because we're seeing how the majority of the world has one opinion, but we're seeing how there's still literally no action. We're still seeing approvals for $14 billion in armed support to Israel. Like it's it's really wild. But at the same time, I do feel like there's little crumbles happening to empire. So it's really important for us as communities to start making the connections between these various systems of oppressions in various parts of the world. Because what's happening in Sudan is actually very much connected to what's happening in Palestine. It's very much connected to what's happening in the Caribbean. It's very much connected to even what's happening still here in Canada in terms of how we look at Indigenous sovereignty and governance and how we claim reconciliation, but there's really no action behind it, right? Um, so it's important for us to mobilize and, and really organize and take action for our own empowerment for our own communities. But thank you for sharing that. Um, so you've also done a lot of work on various issues in communities, and I think it'd be interesting to know what sort of insights you've gained from working with schools and nonprofits um, engaging on these issues. Cause I always find it interesting to see where, where various communities are at. Like when you are brought into institutions, like say an educational institution or a nonprofit organization, who's maybe not too familiar with these issues, but want to learn about these issues. Like what has been your experience in terms of how communities engaged? Are they resistant? Are they receptive? Um, do you see changes happening in these organizations? I'm just um, interested in to the, your insight. And thank you um, for who complimented my earrings. I think it was You're mine. Beautiful. It might be yours though. I'm not it's sure. Mine. I'm wearing many. I'm not wearing many. They're very beautiful. Thank you. My sister actually gave them to me for my birthday, but thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think um, I, uh, not so much, in, I, I've worked in schools sort of at different capacities as a teacher, but I think over the past few years, my relationship with um, sort of the role of an educator has been a little bit different. I've been working um, more on a university level. So I, I'm based here in Montreal and I've been working at Concordia University. Um, and over the past sort of like four and a half years, um, I've been working solely on popular education for um, students at a university level, but also, you know, outside of the university, our, our programming is, is offered to people in the community at large. But a lot of it is really kind of introductions to climate justice and how do we, you know, because as you remember, I come from an environmental studies mm -hmm. background, so that was like the core of my my education was around, uh, was around that. Um, but, you know, I think what I actually, the type of education that I had received around environmental justice and climate justice was unfortunately very, um, focused on what we would call sort of like greenwashing really mm. like it was really sort of like solutions and looking at like different technologies and and different uh, different uh, things that we can do you know things like carbon offsetting and the recycling and these type these type of things this that was like the core component of what we were taught as this is how you deal with environmental uh stuff you know i didn't learn mm. about environmental racism i didn't learn about the role of mining uh and how you know and how like our approaches to the climate really need to be approaches that are very much um built on 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 anti-colonial knowledge and an understanding that the climate justice is simply a manifestation of mm -hmm. uh of of the the many many years of capitalism mm -hmm. and the many many years of extractivism that's been happening and and predominantly in the global south mm -hmm. right predominantly mm -hmm. in the global south i mean i can think of sudan there's a lot of mining gold mining mm -hmm. right um but also just generally in the global south lots of global mining that's happening but that wasn't the type of education that i had received at all mm -hmm. so my approach to it was very different but my um my experience and i i would really say that my my introduction to sort of act activism was really coming more from feminism mm -hmm. But that has really allowed me over the years to be able to learn more and to be able to um, understand that we can't approach gender justice 
um, without uh, approaching our, the root causes, right? And so once you learn more about that, you really also see where climate where climate issues come in. Mm -hmm. um, and we're really pretty much all these different symptoms, right, that we're seeing, whether it's poverty, whether it's the housing crisis or all, all forms of crisis and even even the pandemic, right? Even the yeah. fact that we, that we are in a time where there's a lot of resurgence of different, of new types of pandemics and new types of diseases, right? Um, so that too can be really connected to that. So when I approach my role um, for, you know, sort of popular education and educa education in general surrounding climate justice, this is really where my emphasis mm -hmm. is. But at, at, sometimes I found that it can be difficult, especially because what I found is a lot of people come in through to learn about this um, from a very, you know, from from the the they have an idea that we're really kind of living in a climate crisis and like there's something that I need to do about it. Mm -hmm. um, and, but when they come, you know, my emphasis is really more on yeah, but there are so many collective work that's already happening. There is mm -hmm. a lot of indigenous knowledge that has been present for centuries. Mm -hmm that yeah. unfortunately due to the process of colonization has really is not even seen as like scientific knowledge right mm -hmm. it's not even classified yeah. that and so yeah. and, and it's an interesting position for me as well because i'm doing this inside of the academy mm -hmm. so, so it's it's and it's always this kind of, and i'm also a student you know i'm a graduate mm -hmm. student so there's always this tension between um being a part of the academy and um experiencing to be honest the psychological violence mm -hmm. that, can, that can that a lot of us can experience in these places and and mm -hmm. then kind of like doubting what is that like what can i even do inside this institution mm -hmm. but um mm -hmm. but you know but i think a, a lot of what i've been trying to do is just like on the peripheries of these institutions what what kind of conversations can we be having um mm -hmm. so that's kind of how how i've been approaching it and the in, and the insights really is again is like being able to um have these have spaces for these conversations and have spaces for these conversations on a very uh granular level on a very mm. sort of um step by step you know because people come into these spaces with so many different backgrounds and different and they're different uh different uh, different paths and and really different uh, journeys right now. They're, mm -hmm. Or they're at a different place in their journey, but they know they're interested to learn about these things and they're interested to take action. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's kind of that's kind of been my insight. But one of the things I really because you mentioned resistance, and I think like one of the things that um, I've noticed a lot, especially here in 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 um, in at least in Montreal. I can't speak for the rest of Canada because I don't live there. But um, but we're still and you 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 talked about this very beautifully zahra right? you we're still dealing with a lot of social issues and climate issues at a very sort of like a single issue lens which is not useful at all right because like we're putting so much emphasis separately on migrant justice separately on climate justice separately on this separately on that and even you mentioned like even the, the situation in sudan the situation in the congo in the caribbean uh, in Palestine, you know, like how do we, how do we, um, I think what's important is how do we build our, our tolerance and build our, our, uh, build our, our patience to, to be able to understand the interconnectedness of these different struggles and really not, not deal with them as everything is separate and we got to go fight for housing separately and we got to go mm -hmm. fight for mental health separately, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, it's exactly that. And I think the violence of colonialism is that it sort of conditions us to think of these things as separate, right? That's what they, that's what it, it tends to do um, so that we're not making the connections. And I think even the struggle of being sort of in these institutions that I could empathize with is that while they will and sort of like speak to the value of diversity, speak to the value of inclusion, it's only when it's in compliance to their already established sort of ways of thinking, right? They don't, they don't value diversity of worldviews. They really don't value diversity of conceptualizing how we relate to the world differently. Because really, if you want to look at climate change, climate change is, is about how we relate to our environments, right? And while we live in a capitalistic society that will 
prioritize like pipelines, we're never going to be in relationship with our environments in a way that's conducive to sustaining um, our communities. But there's a lack of acknowledging that, right? Because they want to stay committed to capitalism and that's the problem, right? So it's like working within these systems while trying to dismantle them can sometimes be very, a very daunting sort of process. But I think as long as we continue to speak to our experiences because we have these experiences continue to speak to communities that have been doing this work like you spoke to indigenous and all that. the indigenous and knowledge continues to exist in terms of how we relate and take care of the lands and take care of our waters and and prioritize how we can how we relate to ourselves and our communities um, is really important in our efforts to sort of dismantle and untangle ourselves from these systems that continue to oppress us um, while saying that they serve us, right? Um, so yeah, thank you for sharing all of that. I really appreciate that. Um, I'm just going to look in the chat to see if um, there's any questions or any thoughts or ideas that have popped up from anybody listening in. I feel like Doha has given us so much tidbits of knowledge and for consideration. So j I just want to create some space to make sure like um, we're hearing from, from the people as well in terms of what you want to speak to or if you want to comment on anything, please feel free to drop a comment. Um, but really just to um, not lighten that in my, in the mood a little bit, I just want to really recognize that we are living in such like a highly polar, at least for me, like it feels very highly polarized, really intense, really surreal at times um, where we're holding such conflicting feelings at once. We're trying to live our day-to-day -day lives and, and get through it, but we're seeing atrocities happen through our screens and cell phones. So recognizing so much of our, like so much of our privilege, but also recognizing, you know, the realities of what's happening all over the world. Um, so what are some like sort of care strategies that you you have for yourself to maintain sort of your sanity, maintain your joy? Because we do know in times of oppression, our joy is resistance. Continuing to want to keep on keeping on is part of our resistance. So just wanted to tap into some of your own mitigation strategies as we, we navigate our changing world. Um, what are some things that you do for yourself and for your community? Uh... Yeah, that's that's a, that's a it's a it's a tough question because it's a, I think I, it's something that I that I've been struggling with uh, a lot, and I think a lot of people have been yeah. right in in, the, in this time of the world with everything happening in Palestine and everything happening in Sudan and so on. So it's it's been difficult, but I think um, I think for me personally, I, I really go back to community again, and I think you know. Obviously, people can define what that means for them, right? But yeah. for me, I really think that it has been so, I, I don't want to say uplifting, but just being able to, to alhamdulillah, like have, have spaces with other Sudanese women, have mm. spaces with other black women, other Muslim women, um, spaces that, honestly, spaces that we can make a little bit of time to grieve because I think mm -hmm. with everything going on, at least on, like, on my end, I, uh, I, I intentionally don't make time to grieve a lot because I think mm -hmm. it's, I find it, or at least my perception of it is that it's something that's going to be very disruptive um, because they just feel like it's really heavy. Right. Um, but being able to have just little pockets of, moments that i'm sharing does they don't have to be moments that are like you know like three hours it, it just sometimes it's just like a couple of minutes um of finding people that i can cry with mm -hmm. like you know and people, people that i i don't necessarily have to explain so yeah. much uh what i'm feeling because they're feeling it yeah. too right um and and um yeah i think that's that's really that's really the it's really bringing it back to community and bringing it back to like i would really like i'm blessed alhamdulillah to have like mm -hmm. sisterhoods with a lot of really really incredible Sudanese women some of them still some of them in sudan and some of them outside of sudan but yeah that's beautiful that's really beautiful thank you for that community is so so important to help us navigate all of this Okay, so are there any current projects that you're working on or current things that you might want to share that people can like tap into right away that you would like to share about um, anything you're working on, projects, initiatives, anything like that? 
Yes, uh, thank you so much. I will definitely, I think, drop some things in the chat after in the mm -hmm. uh, after this. But uh, I am a member of the Student Solidarity Collective. I think you probably have seen I've seen them on social, we're on mm -hmm. social media. Um, but yeah, this is a uh, this is a collective that was formed as a response to the outbreak of the war in Sudan. Um, and we um, primarily right now we have a fund that supports the emergency response rooms. Uh, in Khartoum, in Niala, and in Al Fashir, uh, and um, basically the emergency response rooms are like they're like frontline hubs or like networks. Mm -hmm. um, that they're not necessarily like they're not nonprofit organizations or any of that. They're just they're they're networks. They're local networks, and they mainly provide um, sort of mutual. It's it's a mutual aid type of work, but they provide food security. So they run a lot of soup kitchens all over Sudan um they support shelter needs they support evacuation needs um they also support medical assistance as i mentioned earlier the, med the the healthcare industry in sudan you know before the war it was already struggling the healthcare uh, system but of course with the with the war a lot of hospitals have had to shut down mm. and you know um completely under capacities a lot of them unfortunately the militia actually like attacks hospitals like there's really no safe ground with the militia they can go anywhere um, and so they have been, unfortunately, attacking hospitals. They have been attacking, um, kidnapping doctors and nurses and so on. Um, and so this is really, really important work. And I also want to emphasize that, unfortunately, a lot of uh, nonprofits and like the big sort of international organizations that we're very familiar with, a lot of them are no longer operating in Sudan. A lot of them have, in fact, like uh, evacuated very early on in the war. Um, lots of lots of reasons, but many of them are not. Not many of them are there. So this is where it's really, really important to have to support to be able to support local frontline initiatives like yeah. the emergency response rooms. And these response rooms, they're modeled after a very rich history of mutual aid in Sudan, known as Nafir. Um, but so they're taking on these the, these traditions of mutual aid, um, and they also um, are modeled after uh, what's known as the Neighborhood Resistance Committee in Sudan, and these were very very integral uh, and important uh, formations um, during the revolution, and they still are. And so it's, it's also modeled after that, and it's, it, of course also modeled a little bit from sort of in the traditional NGO uh, work. But these uh, these, or these these organizations are frontline; they're very very important, and you know they're they're providing all these. They do all this work while also a lot of them themselves are displaced and are constantly attacked for doing this work. So this is what our, our fund uh, supports. So we accept donations on our website. Uh, we also accept donations through the Darfur Diaspora Association, which is our fiscal sponsor. Um, and I also want to say like a lot of Sudanese communities, um, especially I think in Toronto, they're organizing a lot of protests. Um, keep an eye out on these type of protests that people are organizing in your community and do show up if you can to support. Um, but other things that I have coming up, uh, I will just share like some um, some sort of teach-ins. I'm, I'm involved a lot in teach-ins and panels and stuff like that. So there's a Sudan, Sudan Resistance uh, Front. F follow that page as well, Su Sudan Resistance Front. I think they're based in the U.S. Um, but I have a, a we have a teach-in on February 16th, which actually goes in depth on uh, the context of what's happening in Sudan. And it provides a lot more sort of background. Uh, and if you're at if you're at uh, if you're in Montreal. We have a community benefit um, on April 21st. I'm going to put the maybe the details of it in the chat, but please come by. It's all again going to the fund for the emergency response rooms. Um, but yeah, these are kind of uh, these are these are this is what I want to highlight in terms of the, the the initiatives that I'm involved in. No, that was great. Thank you so much, Doha. And I know Iman. Thank you, Iman, for posting some of the names and the handles for some of. Uh, the things that um, Doha mentioned. Um, hopefully we'll be able to maybe post, do a little post on the website as well. So even once the chat is closed, there will be um, somewhere where you could access that. We'll make sure to put some of these details up on um, the CCMW Black Muslim is Shining um, webpage um, so that you could get to know that. And maybe if there's, do you want to drop your contact details, uh, Doha, or, or how people can contact you directly if they want to learn more, or they want to support you in any sort of way, what's the best way to do that? Yeah, I can put my email in the chat. Okay, great. That would be awesome. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you so much, Doha. It was great to connect with you, and hopefully we will 
are are you coming into town on the seventeenth? I can't remember. I, I really hope okay. so. Uh, I'm just, I'm just hope to be confirmed with my not soon. <laughs> yes, inshallah. Thank you so much, Zahra. Have no a I'll, I'll stick around. I'll no. stick around. Thank you. Okay. Awesome. Uh, how do I burn myself off? <laughs> I actually don't know, <laughs> to be honest. And but you could stick around. I'm actually going to look to see if the other Warda has gotten here because I know there was a little bit of confusion because we had a little bit of the change up with the availabilities. Um, I had given her a new time, and I don't know if she was able to make the new time, so she might still be running late. Um, oh, but look at the time. It's so 7:46. I didn't even realize we went that that long. Um, so just bear with me, everyone, as I check to see if Warda... Oh, thank you, Iman, for the update. Oh, unfortunately, the other Warda cannot make it as well. I was looking forward to chatting chatting with her. Um, she was on last year, though, so it was really more of a catch-up session to see what she's been into. Um, I know she's been doing some amazing stuff on her page with community engagement as well. Um, so it would have been nice to chat with her, but look out for her. Um, I at her handle i think is warda mx it might be on the flyer so inshallah give her some support give her a shout out we're sending love to her despite her not being able to make it nonetheless i think we had a great conversation tonight thank you everyone to everyone who tuned in please look for the event black muslim shining event with ta saleh on um on the 17th for coffee and conversations that's going to be a great great afternoon i think spent lots of um networking to be done there's going to be some black Muslim vendors, some refreshments. I know food is always a good pull for people, so <laughs> please come and eat some good food. Um, meet some of the CCMW team. I'll be there as well. So look forward to engaging with you and building with you and connecting with you guys some more, inshallah. Until then, please take care of yourselves. Please take care of each other. Um, do what you can to maintain good health. Keep on the good fight. All is not helpless. We will get through this and inshallah we will succeed always with Allah's and Allah's all is in Allah's plan. Inshallah. And thank you, Doha, for typing in those details. I'll give people a couple minutes just so that they could copy that down um, before I log off. But inshallah, everybody, have a good night and look out for the details. We'll also update the website. Thank you so much. Salam alaikum. Bye. Okay, once I figure out how to shut off the live too. <laughs> okay. Wow, I really don't know how to use social media, y'all. <laughs> but thanks, everyone. And we are... Wow, I don't know how to do this, guys. I really don't.